I was pulling the boat back up on dry land, the raft, and I uh, heard this noise, this strange noise. I looked around and there was a cow moose about three feet from me. She actually spit on me a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. If I would have reached my hand straight out, I would have touched her in the nose. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts, to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while, but I'll be back soon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can join in the conversation with our new Facebook group called the Destination Angler Connection. Please check that out when you get a moment or two. And if you enjoy the show, please give us a like, share, or follow on Facebook or Instagram, and be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And today, our destination is Western Montana, and instead of covering just one location, we're going to be covering a variety of spots. And our guest is guide and outfitter Jason Morrison of Jason Morrison Outfitters in Billings, Montana. Jason is a multi-species angler who's been fishing these waters for close to 20 years and is an expert on many of the top fisheries throughout the state. In fact, Jason has a unique philosophy that the best fishing can be found away from the crowds and on a wide variety of water, depending on the time of the year. A little bit about Jason. He's originally from West Virginia and holds a bachelor's degree in environmental science and a master's in agriculture from West Virginia University. After college, he spent several years working and managing different ranches in Montana. In addition to his fishing guide business, he's also a hunting outfitter and has been an instructor from Montana's Master Hunter program where he taught backcountry survival skills. And in the winter, he trains horses and has had quite a bit of success on the National Rodeo Tour. And I'll let him tell us about that a little bit later. And he somehow finds time to put in 50 miles a week on his running shoes. So catch your breath as we cover some great locations in search of the fish of a lifetime. Locations such as Rock Creek, Clark's Fork, the Mighty Mo, the Blackfoot, the Lower Yellowstone, and maybe even some backcountry spots. So this should be an interesting episode. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. Appreciate being here. Yeah, absolutely. So, man, you are one busy dude, and you even get time to go out and do a 50-mile run, huh? We're meant to move, I think. There's not a lot of time in my life to, to stand still. You're correct. I like keeping busy. Yeah, that's cool. And then uh, you were telling me before the show, you were up in the backcountry uh, packing in some hay for some personal hunting. That sounds kind of interesting. Yeah, I just got back a few minutes ago from that, did a little... 20, 24 mile circle with my mules. I, I try to take about a week and a half off for the first part of uh, archery elk and get, get way back and hide, hide for a bit. And, uh, it's just some good alone time. Yeah, no, that's good. You know, I was looking at your Instagram page today and, uh, you posted a, a really nice looking, uh, brown trout and, uh, man, how's the fishing been? You know, it's been really good. The main stems of the rivers over here still have a lot of water in them. Some of the tributaries got hit pretty hard. We had a uh, a really early hot spring of shot of three or four days that was up in the upper 90s, 100, the end of May, which is, and so the a lot of the Beartooth and Crazy Range, which feed the lower part of the Yellowstone, which I guide, are a little skinny on water, but the main stem's holding up well. And uh, yeah, thank you. That that fish was caught on a, on a hopper and a uh, big male brown, the gentleman from Kansas called uh, that's a great client of mine Don Hiroff got that fish and nice it went back safe to be caught again it was uh thank you for that yeah and uh, I'm just curious when the fish get that big what's your experience like how how well do they fight when they get that big you know a lot of those bigger fish are out in deeper water especially full moon it was a full moon kind of scenario or a big moon and uh, they honestly fish like a lot of the lake fit, uh, fish do, if that makes sense, Steve. They they move out in yeah. that deeper, co colder water. There's a reason why they're big. They figured out a way to survive. That fish probably came out of five plus feet of water in uh, in heavy water to eat eat a hopper pattern, and uh, it didn't take any amount of time to resuscitate it to uh, get it back. Yeah, and that was on a, a high 80 degree afternoon day. Ah, oh, no kidding. So the big fish are looking up. That's good to hear. Yeah. If I have caught big fish and hoppers on super skinny waters in hot days, and that generally means there's a cold water source, a little spring or something, 
skirting out. Generally, those big boys move out into the deep stuff, but they're still looking up at time. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you and I spoke a couple of weeks ago about being on a show, you know, I asked you, hey, what destination would you get most excited about? And you, you kind of said, hey, I, I'm just not a one destination guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about all of them. That's why I go to so many and, and guide. I'm blessed to guide all around the state in many places. And when I arrive, I'm excited about each and every one of them. Yeah. No, that's cool. I mean, you're, I love your philosophy, you know, that, you know, let's, let's figure out, let's get some permits, you know, in different places around the state and, and go, you know, to where the fishing is the best at a, any given time of year. So I'm kind of curious, like, did you start with this philosophy when you first got into guiding or how did you develop this? That's a good question. You know, honestly, ranching took me to a lot of different destinations, training horses and ranching and living around different parts of the state. And the caveat of most of my employers, I was mostly running ranches, but the caveat was that I continued my guide business as a youngster. And that took me to different corners. And I saw different times at different rivers and fisheries fished at their peak and then developed that game plan over over a multiple year period. Okay. And then I'm fortunate enough to be a business owner and and not work for others, which has allowed me to be able to move around like that. Right. And kind of decide what your own strategy is, right? And so you've got guides that you're booking all over the state then too. It's not just you, it's other guides as well. I have a few. I'm a small business guy. At times I've had a, a big business and many guides and I decided to pull back a little bit. And I have a few core guides from Fort Peck to Missoula in different parts of the state and many of which are been in the business as, as long or longer than I do. And um, okay. yeah, it, uh, I don't have a whole slew of guides waiting beneath me, but uh, okay, a few. I try to do more of a quality than quantity business. It was hard for me personally to have the same quality of trips when I was in peak season, had eight, nine, 10 boats scattered about everywhere. So I don't know if that makes sense at all, but yeah, it allows me to, to I feel, have the primo quality. Of, so I can show people the best trip they, they can have. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And like I said, looking at your Instagram posts, you're, you're tangling with some, with some big ones, man. And, uh, you know, people, people love that, you know, they love a great experience, but you know, they like catching big fish too, obviously. I noted you, you kind of make it your mission to avoid the crowds as much as possible too, right? I do. There's certain times in certain rivers that that's not possible, but that's the reason why I go where I go is, is to avoid avoid the masses. And uh, I think I think part of the mystique of fishing in the West and, and floating down a river or being on a, a rural res, you know, lake, you, you, to me, you don't want to see, look around and see 20 other anglers. And sometimes, sometimes it um, makes for a little bit more travel and a little bit more commitment, to be honest with you, Steve. But yeah, I'm sure that some people don't want to do that, but that's kind of the foundation. That's what keeps me excited about being a guide, being an outfitter for the last 19, 20 years is finding those destinations and that uh, not a lot of people have experienced. Yeah. So I was in Colorado earlier this summer and came across this really cool app called Trout Routes. If you've ever looked for a good map to help you with anything from public access to finding the best trout streams in a given area, I highly recommend checking out Trout Routes. Trout Routes has mapped out each and every trout stream by state, covering public land access, places to camp, hiking trails, stream flows, bridge access points, boat launches, fly shops, and even interactive elevation charts. And you can download maps for offline use. Today, they cover seven states, including Colorado and the Driftless region in the Midwest. Hey, we did a show on the Driftless a couple of months ago. And good news, they're working on a big update to add seven new states, including Montana, Wyoming, and Michigan. So if you have an upcoming trip or looking to explore nearby streams, I suggest you check out Trout Routes today on your Apple or Android phone. We won't ask you to reveal your, your secret, secret spots here, but, uh, you know, today we'd like to just walk through the seasons, you know, like how do you break down Western Montana based on the seasons and uh, what's going on that's drawing you to certain areas? So start wherever you want. I start out, if the weather's permitting, I have some sneaky spots in North Central Montana that I'll go to real early in March and April. 
but that's kind of weather permitting as you probably well know it can be winter or spring here that time of the year it uh yeah it's variable but as a consistent basis i start in march early april in a spot which actually has the the most pressure of any spot that i go to they call it lot g now it used to be called land of the giants over the gates of the mountain and it's during the rainbow spawn and um, it fishes a lot like alaska fishing when the rainbows come out of the lake system and go up the short short stemmed rivers and it's named land of the giants for a reason in jet boat scenario up a river and uh, I have some guides over there as well that are very good and live over there. Then I go to Fort Peck for a longer period after that, and uh, generally for about a month. And when the water temperature is pretty cold and all the lake fish are super shallow, you can catch big walleye sometimes in two foot of water during darker conditions. Fish for smallies, uh, northern pike on on the fly. There's a period there where we get lake trout on a fly rod. They're they're up and just above 20 pounds, and um, they're fun. Yeah. And there's some different techniques that I use that's kind of similar to shark fishing to get them on the fly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? When you catch a shark on conventional tackle or fly rod, there's generally many a couple other sharks that will follow certain species, and so you you're able to catch one on sometimes conventional tackle if they're in deep water and to where you're, they're out of range of a sink, full sink tip and then sight cast its buddy that's beside of it. Oh, interesting. So you, you draw one in with conventional tackle, then you get the fly right out and try to get the next. Mm-hmm. Okay. There's times during early enough where you don't have to do that, but it's kind of a unique thing that I don't know too many people that do. Yeah. But yeah. And then after that, Come probably the second week in June, I pull out of Fort Peck, and then I head to Missoula area, the Blackfoot, Rock Creek especially. That's where I first landed when I was in my early 20s there, and my mentor, uh, John Perry, that is, uh, we work together as both outfitters and guide for each other, and then he's the biggest permit uh, holder on Rock Creek, and uh, it's a super fun little fishery fast and furious and uh i love that place it's getting better by the year i don't know last time but whirling disease really uh hurt it in the late 90s early 2000s and those real nice football rainbows are coming back and it uh it's a cool spot we fish the salmon fly hatch and the golden stone hatch and then there's some great green drake hatches that are pretty epic there and then um it hits some really special windows of dry fly fishing on the Blackfoot, which is not far away at all. The Clark Fork, which is a favorite of mine, is usually a little out of shape, still a little too big that time of the year, but certain years can be very good as well. So I'll stay there till June 30th. That's the last last day you can float Rock Creek as a, you know, a fisherman coming from anywhere or a guy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then I come back home to the Billings area after that and key in on um, the lower Yellowstone, below Livingston, a lot of times below Big Timber. Oh, even below Big Timber. Okay. Yep. And uh, then I do the Stillwater some, and then uh, then I lease eight and a half miles of a private fishery between Bozeman and Billings, which is a brown trout fishery that's that's very good. All that water... Yellowstone drainage water on the east side of the divide comes down. So the runoff starts later and lasts longer is why I don't fish at home during the month of June. It's blown out. Okay. So June and then, uh, uh, and then so July, what, August, you're, you're kind of doing the, the waters around your home. Is that right? Yeah. And then I'll, I'll do Bighorn Reservoir, which is one of the prettier places I've ever been. It's just a really narrow lake that winds around and sheer cliff walls that go up hundreds of feet straight up on both sides. It's at times can be uh, you know, some big trout in there, but you have to get them on the, earlier when the water temperature's a bit cooler. And there's it's great smallmouth fishery as well. Huh. But uh, then in August, I'll start fishing, even sometimes in July. It, uh, I'll go back towards Missoula and fish the Clark Fork, which is a great fishery. It's 
I think 380 some odd miles long and, uh, you know, probably one of the under more underrated fisheries in the entire West. Upper parts of brown rainbow fishery, lower part, there's some big browns in there, but the rainbows are a little grabbier in the summer. Browns go Okay, deep. grabbier, like easier to catch, grabbier? Yeah, with the dry. And okay. I try to dry fly fish a lot, a whole lot. That's I'm not scared to go down and dirty, but that's what I enjoy. I mean, I, I love streamer, surface streamer fishing as well, where you can see the eat. But uh, when they're eating visual, that's what I personally try to structure my trips over, if that makes sense. Ton of fun. Absolutely. So uh, tell me about Clark's Wharf, because you said it was, it's the most underrated fishery in Montana. Why is that? It got a lot of guff from being polluted. At the headwaters of it in Anaconda, there was a zinc smelter that uh, caused a lot of pollution in the headwaters of it. And then just above Missoula, there was a dam that was taken out a few years ago called the Milltown Dam under a super fun site. And that dam caught uh, all of the heavy metal contamination that's made its way down down the watershed. Okay. So oh, man. when that dam was released, then there was a influx of heavy metal contamination down lower in the watershed, which killed a lot of invertebrates. So it's got a lot of publicity because of that, which uh, caused a lot of negative thought about the river. But, you know, the lower is, is super special throughout the year. It uh, It's just a cool fishery. There are a lot of fish that are just willing willing to eat the dry throughout the summer. It's consistent and it's beautiful. And uh, there's just not a lot of people do it. It's just big, long river. Yeah. I lived over there and I started guiding. I moved to Montana when I was 22 and started guiding when I was 22, both fishing and hunting. And that's kind of where I cut my teeth, the Blackfoot. I lived on Rock Creek in Granite County towards Phillipsburg. And then I, I fished. When those went down, I fished a lot through the summer and fall on the lower Clark Fork and through the through the entire watershed of the Clark Fork and just kind of like home to me that makes sense steve yeah no it does yeah you know what i want to dive in a little deeper on these spots you were ticking off here but uh yeah i'd love to hear you know your story so you moved to montana when you're a pretty young man and uh how how did you end up moving from west virginia to montana (laughs) a dream of mine when i was a little boy i think my family homesteaded i don't i think it's like six or seven generations back the farm ranch i was born on and uh wow and i always heard stories from relatives and my grandfather that came out and uh i knew that the place that i was raised wasn't big enough to feed another family i don't remember when i started fly fishing there was native fisheries very near my house and lots of of stock water ponds that held warm water fisheries and it was a a very popular thing around my family to uh to fly fish and to sport fish and we we filled our freezers and ate the the eating fish as well but just developed a love for it and uh, couldn't really afford to go to college in the west needed to stay in state and got through it as quickly as possible and uh, graduated with a master's degree at 22 and was a guide in montana at, at 22 nice it's a lifelong dream and at the age of 26, I was offered a ranch manager position. And the caveat, as I said before, that I maintained my guiding. And luckily, the owner was the avid fly fisherman himself, which enjoyed going with me. And uh, did that for quite a number of years, working in different... I worked at, uh, at that particular ranch in Montana for six years and then moved on to a couple other ranches in different places of the state to just experience some new cowboying, I guess per se, but then learned a lot of other waters at the same time because I was always guiding and fishing on my days off. So that that's kind of developed the, uh, I guess you'd say the gypsy kind of uh, fishing, the move around fishing technique that I have embraced now and enjoy. I still uh, train horses in the wintertime. I do clinics and private lessons and different places all across the United States in the winter. Then I am not a national finals rodeo qualifier, but my training partner. Oh, you're not? No, my training partner in the wintertime is, and he competes in a event called the Timed Event, which is nicknamed the Iron Man of Cowboys. And uh, I help him train through through the wintertime and 
I've sold sell horses to guys that uh, compete on a very high level as well. But I would uh, that would be a full time thing. I'd have to quit my outfitting if I was going to make a run for. Uh, but I'm I'm just a horse trainer. I guess you not a big time competitive guy. I used to ride bareback horses. You're not horses the rodeo Bronx, guy. Bronx. Oh, I used to ride. I used to ride bareback horses in Bronx poorly for a number of years, but uh, chose to save my body and uh, keep fishing instead. Oh, that's awesome. And then, uh, like, how soon after you got out of college did you jump in your truck and head west? I believe as fast as I had to earn a little gas money in uh, for a couple <laughs> months, and then then headed west. I, I I believe it was late June, so it wasn't. It didn't take me that long to earn enough gas money. Oh, my gosh. Good for you. And it, and it seemed to have worked out, huh? You know, my life's been a blessing. I do all all the things that I dreamt about when I was a little boy playing that, that you know, you, you always pretend you want to be a fireman or you want to be a cowboy or what have you. But I, it's been a true blessing. Ah, good for you. Yeah, not many guys can say that, you know, that they're really living their dreams. But here you are. You can say that. Nothing's perfect, Steve. It, but I... I, I honestly don't think I'd I'd change a thing. I have forty four years old and just have a, actually today is my son's birthday, so and yeah. uh, have a have a beautiful young one year old son and and a wife that uh, that I love dearly and that tolerates me being gone a lot. There you go. So yeah, well she must have known that when she married you, right? That uh, that was your life. She did. She loves me enough to to accept it. I'm sure. I'm sure deep down she might want to stay home more. But <laughs> Every now and then. That's not me. Yeah. Well, it's cool you're home for your son's birthday today. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah. I noticed uh, at West Virginia University that you've had some uh, well-known people come out of there. Don Knotts, right? From Andy Griffith Show and Bob Huggins, <laughs> your coach. A couple other guys. You ever bump into those guys? Yeah. Don Knotts was my uh, my uncle's roommate in college oh my gosh he uh spoke highly of him he said he was a riot oh really my uncle was a went on to be a college professor in arkansas and was a stand-in fiddle player but uh for uh, a lot of big bands and uh and yeah don knotts he always spoke highly of him and then huggy bear no, never met bob huggins but he's great he's a great resource as well as being a good coach, he just does such great things for for the state, non nonprofit. Yeah, that's really cool. Well, hey, let's get back to uh, some of these places that you love to fish. So uh, when I was, you know, reading on your website about, you know, Fort Peck Reservoir, honestly, I hadn't, that had not been on my radar at all. And I'm reading this, that it's uh, the fifth largest reservoir in the United States with a gigantic shoreline that's uh, twice the size of the California Pacific coastline. Man, what a spot. Correct. It's a giant lake that grows. Every species in there grows huge. Uh, I think I was telling you about a shad that called a Cisco, that uh, really oily, fatty minnow shad that, that they consume that uh, really just makes giant big fish, healthy fish. It's a, uh, really special fishery to me, especially for, well, I mean, some folks are just really keyed into warm water type, and I mean by warm water, non-trout fisheries, yeah, or the angler that's just wants a new experience. And uh, I grew up going sometimes to northern Quebec and Ontario and, and uh, fishing the Great Lakes. And that's kind of what... Uh, inspired me to be a captain. I had my captain's okay. license a long yeah. time ago. And uh, it's a great way of, I, I love it. I love, I love the, the small rivers and the big rivers, but it just, it just really fires me up to see those giant fish. If that makes sense, Steve. Yeah. And I get them a lot when they're shallow and it's a light tackle spin situation or, or a fly fishing situation. And I always up a fly rod when it's conducive. Okay. What's a good sized northern pike out of there? Out of there, you know, just a giant fat 43, 44 is a good one out of there. Inches? Yes, inches. Okay. There's um, a big walleye, 15 pounds, a big lake trout, 
is 20 or over. You know, smallmouth, there's six plus seven pound smallies in there. And uh, they're super fun to catch on the fly as well. A lot of times they, for whatever reason, they seem to be really reluctant to eat right off of the bat. A lot, a lot of times they'll, it's all, you'll see them come in from the water super clear and you'll see them come in from 10, 15 feet away and they'll eat right off your rod too. Oh, really? Are you hitting them with dry flies or what are you using? Streamer. Oh, streamers. Okay. Um, streamers that look like a Cisco little uh, shad thing, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you, do you fish for carp in that lake too? You know, I do fish for carp in, um, in Fort Peck and Bighorn Reservoir. And there's there's a lot of days you can catch the carp on dries. Oh, really? Which is a, mm-hmm, Which can be a technical thing. They're cruising right to left, left to right quarter and trying to get the correct lead. And uh, they're pretty picky at times. I was fishing a few weeks ago with my wife and we were fishing a mud line. And this carp actually came up and oh, it was about a, probably about a 25, 30 pounder. And it came up and actually opened its mouth and licked my fly and refused it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think in a way it was better than not catching it. In a way it was better than not catching because I, I, I had never seen one actually in the middle of its tongue with its mouth wrapped around the fly, just licked it. <laughs> and then said, no, Did you yank? Not today. Not today. Not today. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, it might've taken you down to your knot, you know, a carp that big. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's an eight weight kind of carp. Yeah. What, what are you uh, using to, to, to get a carp? What kind of flies are you using? Well, you know, beetle patterns are the, uh, Oh, okay. Are generally in mid to late summer what they uh, choose, but they can be kind of picky on them from lake to lake. As a word of advice, don't, be careful of what kind of uh, floating or you put on them because they're pretty sensitive to oh they'll smell it to smells yeah that's how they sift through the bottom and uh, they're a pretty wily creature that's honestly not very much of my target species I enjoy fishing for them and some of my god buddies make fun of me but uh, <laughs> it's probably in as very close to fishing for you know bonefish or or it's a lot similar to the ocean at times. It's long, longer casts, correct leads, but that's not the mainstay of, of my business is carp. Yeah, you're uh, right. You're probably not making a living on carp. But, uh, uh, well, let's talk about, um, I don't know, let's let's jump over to the, the Blackfoot and Rock Creek. Um, you're fishing uh, salmon fly hatch, golden stones, and some green drakes. And... Uh, Rock Creek, I've been to Rock Creek a couple of times and it's it, gosh, one of my favorite streams in the whole state of Montana because it's it's super weightable, you know, once you get beyond the the June flows. But what uh, what do you like about Rock Creek? You know, the backstory to Rock Creek with me, as I briefly mentioned before, is I used to live over there. That's where I met my wife. My mother and father in law have have a cabin off the grid there. My mentor, the guy that that uh took a risk and allowed me to to start guiding for him straight out of West Virginia, lives at the base. So I go over there particularly for the floating season, and uh, which is the month of June, really. Yeah. And then start with the salmon fly hatch. And uh, the salmon fly hatch starts at the base of the creek and goes up. And some years it's a slow trickle, and other years they just race up and it's over. And then the golden stones go, and it's usually a longer hatch. And... Honestly, after the first part of the salmon fly hatch, the fish actually taste like the taste of the golden stones a bit better. And, uh, oh, okay. and soon, as soon as they see a few, key in on them better. And then during certain years, there's some world-class green drake hatches, which are epic. The blackfoot as well. Fish love brown and green drakes. Trout, excuse me, love brown and green drakes and will stop eating just about anything to, to consume one. But I, I fish there on till uh, the last day of floating on June 30th. And then uh, and one thing to back up, Steve, I just want everybody to know just to be careful if on Rock Creek, if you're floating in it, it can be very dangerous. And myself and the guides there are, are know all the deadfalls and know what's around the next corner. But uh, there's been, been a lot of non-commercial 
folks that have got hurt and, and some other and some worse scenarios in the past there. So just, oh, man. just do your homework and be careful if you're going to float that thing. But uh, as you said, when you fished it, after it comes down uh, and the flows drop, then it's a tremendous weight fishery as well and very beautiful. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, and there's a really cool little restaurant right at the base there. Extrams, is that what it's called? Yes, yeah, family-owned restaurant. It's just like you, it's like you drop back into history into the 1800s, isn't it, when you step foot in there? Yeah, one of the best breakfasts I've ever eaten anywhere. It was just so good. And uh, there's a, you know, an animal, one of every kind of animal hanging up in there too. You know, you got bear <laughs> yeah. and bobcat yeah. and mountain lions. And- the family is an outfitting family as well in a sense. Oh. Gotten out of it. But uh, yeah, the family has a lot of, of hunting tradition in the area and took a lot of, of folks in that nasty, rugged, dark timber country over the years yeah yeah we've seen a lot of moose on rock creek super special yes the moose had a tough time for a while but they're starting to come back there was a giant pack of wolves there that uh consumed most of the wool uh elk or the excuse me the moose the moose actually i uh I got charged by a moose when i was guiding there on upper rock creek this year really a fisherman of mine uh we're coming into a little slough that pumps really clear, great water, and there's always cutties in there sipping, and, and he broke off. And I, I raced across with my raft, rowing to the other side, and jumped out and pulled the boat up on the bank to try to recycle, meaning do tie him back on and do that, go and get back over that slough. And I was pulling the boat back up on dry land, the raft, and I... Uh, heard this noise, this strange noise. I looked around and there was a cow moose about three feet from me. What? Oh my gosh. She actually spit on me a little bit. A little bit. Oh yeah, the nerve of her. <laughs> if I would have reached my hand straight out, I would have touched her in the nose. And That must have scared the heck out of you. No, it's just kind of uh, went into self-preservation mode, I guess you would say. Hell bad. So I raised my hand straight in the air and yelled at her and she backed off about 15, 18 feet and sniffed two twin calves that were standing there and then char- and then charged at me again and she didn't get that close the second time. But uh, really? needless to Like a false charge? Yes, yes. But yeah, she was about three feet from me the first time. But needless to say, I did not row over to that, that slough. We went on down the river. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll leave that one alone. I saved that slough for another, another day. Were you reaching for your can of bear spray when the thing was that close? Or? And, well, when, when you're in that situation, uh, the bear spray was the last thing. It was a long ways away. And uh, no, there was no time. Wasn't even time. Have you seen any grizzly bears in all your experiences? Yes. Okay. I've been fortunate enough to travel on quite a few, a number of places in the world that hold grizzlies. But, uh, but yeah, I've, I've been charged once in Montana and once in Alaska and then saw quite a few grizzlies in Kamchatka, Russia, but, uh, they have a whole different mindset. They've been harvested and poached for many years and, and don't have a different respect. Um, uh, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've been been charged once in montana and once once in alaska oh my gosh well you're like on your third life out of nine here i think i would say that moose pose pose more of a threat to yeah the majority of the time than than grizzly bears do just especially for fishermen they're more around the water so that's what i've heard be respectful of the bulls in the fall and then the cows in late spring early summer because they're protecting their calves, they can get you. But yeah, the the grizzlies are 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 sure something to be aware of for sure. But I'm I feel like I'm Steve. I'm probably a lot more at risk driving to town than getting hurt by a grizzly. So probably. Well, uh, let's talk about the Blackfoot. Uh, what do you like about the Blackfoot? I think you said you were fishing salmon flies there as well in the same month. You kind of switch back and forth between Rock Creek and and the Blackfoot, or yeah, I do. It's they're very close together, and uh, I enjoy fishing the Blackfoot. There's a certain window there when the fish can get really in tune to salmon flies. You can, you know, we've caught some pretty pretty nice bull trout even on salmon flies over the years. That's a big bull trout fishery, by the way, which we're not allowed, and I don't 
fish for for them, target them. But but we've uh, we've got some giants catching tr- fishing for the other species in there over the years. That uh, there can be some great green drake catches on the Blackfoot as well. I fish it predominantly in June when I'm over around Rock Creek, and then and just just try to try to key in on the right on the correct days to do it the water the water's big there that time of the year but the blackfoot fishes well up into the summer too i have guides over there that do it and do it for me at different times that's just when i'm there right right well i've, I've fished it a couple times and have done really really well and it's good yeah kind of like uh late july i fished it once in early september and we did fine back then yeah it fishes well throughout. Of course, it's the it's the river runs through it river, right? So uh, it kind of made famous, famous from the book and the movie. In my opinion, it holds well to its reputation. It's beautiful. You know, it's certainly a bucket list, list river, I think, as well as Rock Creek, both those to do it. Yep. Would you agree? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, there's some great outfitters out there, you and some other folks. So absolutely. Do you get over to Craig, Montana and fish in Missouri down there? Is that Holder Dam area? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I slip over there from time to time as well. You know, when most people are over there is you know, when it's the boat volumes at its highest, to be honest with you, is when I'm not. A lot of the, you know, anglers, both commercial and non, uh, hit that when everything else is blown out because it's clear. It's a tailwater. And, uh it kind of as we discussed before, I don't like seeing a ton of boats if I don't have to. So I'll do that early and then late in the fall that, that can fish very well. There's some super good trico hatches in July there as well. But uh, I try to key in during dry fly time and streamer time and not nymph time over there. Yeah. Okay. Because at times it can be a nymphy river, river at times. Oh, interesting. Going back to some of these... Uh... Some of these bigger flies, the uh, the big these salmon flies and golden stones and whatnot. Do you find that these fish gorge themselves, and there's a period of time where they're just not eating because they're just gorged on these gigantic flies? I do. I think that's a very valid point. Yes. And what do you do? Go to smalls. Okay. Yeah, I do. So think about think about the variety of the insects that are hatching during that time, and go down through your list to the small stuff. Absolutely. Okay. And they might just maybe get a little dessert instead of the big cheeseburger, huh? Yes. I think that that uh, even in the rivers and the lakes, there's a certain time periods in these really fertile ones to where the fish are just gorged. You know, the other day I experienced much the same in the private fishery that we were fishing. By late afternoon, the fish were just bloated and gorged on grasshoppers, actually. There's so many grasshoppers water. I stood on one high bank and counted over 20 that I could see in the small, small little creek grasshoppers. Oh, really? At one time. So that, that's when you choose to downsize and uh, just have a little morsel, just one, one extra little small tasty snack instead of the big filet mignon. That's a great tip. So like what, a little uh, Belmoni Dunn or a little caddis or something? Yeah, it could be that, you know, if they're, if it's early, you know, throw on, um, uh, Whatever's in season could be a super early in the March brown or PMD, you know, June or or a caddis or a small terrestrial during the summer. Oh, that's great, man. That's a great tip. You know, they're, I've seen to where they they're on uh, these big fish are bloated and full, but they'll they'll take a thin little ant. They just can't help themselves. Just got to go up and grab that thing. Exactly. Well, I know you were uh, you're pretty excited about Clark's Fork, and I love the fact I'd heard this through the years that it's really gotten really good. And you're sort of confirming that. Talk to us about Clark's Fork and how you kind of break that down. And uh, you said like the lower is really good at certain times a year. I've said this for a lot of years, and I think I stated on my website. The Clark Fork's a special spot to me, but I, I really think it's one of the more underrated fisheries in the West. The headwaters of the Clark Fork is Anaconda, near Anaconda in Montana. And yeah, it's beautiful up there. It is. It is. I it, That's near Deer Lodge, which is, I lived in Deer Lodge for six years and uh, fished all of that. But there, many years shut down, there used to be a, a, a zinc smelter in Anaconda, which contaminated the upper part of the watershed, heavy metal contamination. 
and uh, during the early years, it was dead water. It just it was too contaminated, and the stream rehabilitated itself enough to be a very good brown trout fishery, but a snotty one. And then there's during the typical water years, the upper part is dewatered, meaning that the uh, state decreed more water rights than there is water during a oh is that right average or below yeah so a lot of those fish it just retreat to sloughs ditches and and come back that were there the lower middle and the lower part of the park fork there's enough tributaries to bring water back and because that the middle and the lower part is as much ranch country so then just upstream i should say in missoula there was a dam called milltown dam which was a catch for all of that nasty heavy metal contaminated sediment going downstream over many decades so a super fun site um, a little less than a decade ago removed the milltown dam which in turn flushed a lot of that sediment downstream and killed a lot of the invertebrates so the clark forks had its struggles over the years but if you know where to go can, has been consistently good and is on the game as far as a fishery as well, which is making its tributaries better as well because of the dam. So the the during spawning and the influx of, of fish coming up river in the Clark Fork, because the Blackfoot and Rock Creek are tributaries, major tributaries of the Clark Fork. Yeah, right. So it just uh, it completes the circle if that if that makes sense at all, Steve. Yeah. But yeah, I believe there's 380 some odd miles of the Clark Fork, and I've fished it all. It changes a lot from upstream to downstream. It's a very good fishery. And where where would you say, you know, where does the middle section, you say the upper kind of runs out of water, well, where would you start to pick up where the middle section is? Missoula. Oh, Missoula. Oh, right there. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Because a couple of times I've fished out of Missoula and the guides are like, yeah, we could do Clark Fork or Blackfoot. And I've always been, let's do the Blackfoot. Just because in the back of my mind, I've got this picture of the problems with the Clark Fork, but I love hearing that it's it's doing so well. So I'll have to get out there and do it. It can be some of the best small dry fishing that you'll see, you know, the, during the middle and lower, and during certain hatches, the rainbows pot up and there's days, there's days in there that I don't blind cast. I don't have my fishermen blind cast much at all. It's just all spot and stock, which is... Into those pods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, it's great. Great spot. Well, cool. I think the lower Yellowstone, if I may add to, is, is a great spot. A totally different fishery. Fish is totally different, but it's just... They just pure freestone rivers that fish have to... When you catch a giant fit, a trout, they just have to work really hard to get big and dang good at it. Yeah, absolutely. I enjoy a good mix between the, the tailwaters and the freestone, and they're usually a lot different. Yeah. Do you head up into the Beartooths ever? Uh, I know you've, you've done quite a bit of backpacking in your life. Do you get up there much and fish those lakes? Yes. Yeah. I work, I'm a, a booking agent as well, and so the Beartooth is public land that would be southwest as the crow flies from Billings and borders uh, the north side of Yellowstone Park. And uh, I work with one of the major outfitters that leases that land from the Forest Service. And uh, we bring we bring folks back into those mountain lakes and rivers and creeks. And it's a special spot, beautiful, and there there's some really good fish in there. Wow. Yeah, I've been up there a couple of times, you know, backpacking in. And boy, we've done really, really well. What's what's your experience been? You know, what's a, what's a decent day in the bear tooth? A decent day, it depends what you're targeting. But if most of those mountain lakes, you can catch as many as you want. Right. When you find the right spot and what they're eating, is that your experience, Steve? Yeah, right. It, it depends on the lake, but sometimes it's just silly. You got to move. There's yeah. there's just you know two on on every cast. You got to go get away from them, and they follow you sometimes, right? Yes. Yeah. They are, as, as they say, they are grabby. They are wanting a meal. You know, they're, that's high elevation stuff, and their window of, of eating is so short. And um, it's pretty impressive how uh, the size at some of those lakes as well when they have such a short window to eat. Yeah, right. So they're really keying in on things. But I have found, I'm wondering about you, if 
that, um, you know, some of these lakes have got a lot of little fish in them and then some of them don't have as many fish, but have got some really nice ones in them. And it's just, you kind of just don't know till you get up there and try them. Correct. And it can change, you know, winter kill is a big thing. Some of those lakes are, are uh, you know, not as deep as, as others. So, you know, some of them are almost cyclic at times. The so you, the beauty of it is there's a lot of them. And just uh, if you don't find what you want, go to the next. Is that is that your experience? Yeah. I mean, we sort of map it out. There's a lot of good resources. I've found some resources at the state of Montana has got a website and you can kind of read some of the stocking reports and occasionally someone will put some comments on there. And I found a, actually the picture on my logo on, you know, my Instagram page and Destination Angler website is me holding a 24-inch cutthroat that I caught in the Beartooth Range at 10,000 feet. And we bushwhacked up to this lake, had no idea. You know, I saw a report that looked like it might be good. I got up there and it was like silly good, like you're having to get away from them. And all of a sudden I just tossed a, you know, something off the edge, you know, off of a little, you know, edge there. And uh, this gigantic fish, man, I, I didn't know. It looked like it was three feet long and the reflection in the yeah. water. <laughs> You know, I thought, what did I just catch here? Like a prehistoric coelacanth or something? And I got it in. It was still a nice fish. It was 24 inches, but yeah, it was pretty cool. Congratulations. I saw that picture. That's a monster. Yeah, especially yeah, like it's a you good said, one. at 10,000 feet. Literally, ice out at that elevation during the typical year is not till way up, not till June. And then by the 15th to the 20th of September, it's it's starting to snow in wintertime again at that elevation up there. So that fish does not have an easy life. Right. And it's probably a old timer too, right? Because the growing season's so short. Yes. Well, let me ask you something. You know, you've made a life out of out of the outdoors and fishing. What is, what is, uh, what is fishing in Montana mean to you personally? As I said, as a scenario, looking back from when I was a little boy, it's a dream come true. Sometimes I have to pinch myself. I think, uh, I think at this stage of my life, I honestly enjoy showing others and um, just like that big brown you come in the other day i honestly was more excited for the angler to catch that fish than i would have been oh that's great i just enjoy sharing all of what i do with others and especially these rivers the preservationist side you know we'll keep a fish or two out of a lake as a whole you know a warm water species lake i mean not not that bear tooth lake is a whole different scenario but just, you know, being able to release that big fish that you caught or that, that I caught the other day and, and having a chance at it again or that somebody else can, can do it. Heck yeah. It's a renewable resource that is pretty special to me. Right. Yeah, I would agree. Okay. One last question. Got any tips on some great watering holes throughout the state as people are traveling around and hitting these different areas? Uh, what do you like? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that uh, extrams that you mentioned a bit ago is uh, aside from aside from a good breakfast, that's a good evening watering hole as well. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, hmm, what other? Didn't I mention one earlier? Yeah, for the Fort Peck Lodge you mentioned before the show. I mentioned one. I mentioned one to you. Yeah, the Fort Peck Lodge is a cool spot. It uh, was built when the dam was the Fort Peck Dam is the biggest dirt dam i believe in the world it was built in the 1930s and uh that was built to house the workers and then right down the street is a theater that they built to uh entertain the workers and that is in full working order during the summertime as well and the the lodge has a nice little watering hole in the basement with and it uh it's a cool spot. It just shows a huge peak of American history, just like Ekstrom's does. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Well, there you go, folks. A couple of good spots to wet your whistle at the end of a great day on the water with Jason, hopefully. Well, Jason, it was great having you on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. You bet. How can our listeners get in touch with you? I have a website, Jason Morrison Outfitters, uh, dot com and and um, I'm present on Instagram, same thing, Jason Morrison Outfitters. And you can feel free, my number, email, all that is on the contacts there. Feel free to call, email, text me anytime. If I don't get right back to you, I'm probably on the water. But Doing what you love to do. Well, I'll post all <laughs> this on our show notes on our website. 
And uh, if you've got comments and suggestions, please uh, drop me a line at shag50 at gmail.com. That's S-H-A-I-A-G-H-5-0 at gmail.com. And if you're a guy and you want to be on the show, give me a shout. Always looking for new places to feature. Uh, hey, and if you found it in your heart to give us a five-star review wherever you get your podcast, we'd certainly appreciate that. As always, our music is by Brothers Fountain. Hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you again next week. Well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go From the land to the shining sea But I know, I know, I know, I know There's more to life than what the eye can see